The journey of being single is the journey that they need to go through to develop their greatest potential. And if somebody comes over to you, but any simcha, and tells you anything about your shidduch, <laughs> just tell them God has a plan for me. Not alone. Lots Thank of you. people have fear. <laughs> we have done therapy. And I know what my issues are, I know where they come from, I know why they're there, but I can't change how I feel. The main way to reprogram the subconscious mind is to do conscious work. I was very impressed. Men usually don't like to do that. And so I, I only went there because I felt you would go there. Advice for a married couple. Go and watch their wedding video again together. What's the best location for a first date? Not a restaurant sitting opposite each other. What should somebody do if they're not getting any dates? Can I do tough love a little? Yeah. <laughs> If people aren't getting dates, then they're the common denominator of that pattern. That's a very oh. common pattern. Right. Attraction is not Hollywood attraction. Attraction is a draw. Uh, yeah, Chaim. Uh, How does one know that this is the one? If it feels like home. Wow. You can only have it feel like home if you're at home in yourself. Wow. We have a lot more power over our reality than we realize. Hashem mm -hmm. gives us that power. I'm a different person right now. So the positivity. Today I have the honor of bringing up the Honorable Mrs. Jackie Glaser, which is a dating coach and helps a lot of people find the spark within themselves so that they can go out in the world and date and build a happy relationship so that they can have a happy marriage um, going forward. Did I say it right? Is that, is that basically what you do? Helping people find their inner spark? Their inner spark. What do you mean by inner spark? Um, just what they want to do in life and because some people are lost with that. They're not exactly right. sure what they want to do. Right. So I, I hope I help some people do that. I feel like what I, what I aim to do is empower singles because mm -hmm. I feel that being single in the, in the Jewish observant community, whichever community you're in, is sometimes really hard. And yeah. I know that firsthand because right. I experienced that for many years single. Is was, it easier in the non-Jewish world to be single? Oh, yeah. And oh. why is that? I never heard this. So oh, why, yeah. why do you think it is? Because there's not as much judgment. There's not as much pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, on the one hand, we value right. family and we value marriage very highly, which is beautiful and good. But yeah. at the same time, then, if you don't fit into that, it's also then you feel that somehow it's something wrong with me. I, I'm, I'm not okay. I'm this. I'm a nebuch. I'm a loser. Yeah. I'm a this. And then that is more crippling than anything else, is believing right. that and judging yourself. And it gets into like a self-fulfilling so, prophecy. Right. So do we have to change that belief? Yes. Or do we have to change the fact, or do we have to change and, and get more shadichim done? Both. Wow. Meaning, I don't believe we get shidich, shidichim right. done. I think it's all Hashem. But I think that we have to change our attitude as singles, and we have to change our attitude as community. Right. And the two together create this this dynamic that is very unhealthy and very toxic and very damaging to singles. And so, you know, we were mentioning before that really it's about how we can talk from two angles. One is how the community responds and the other is how a single responds. I'm, I work with the singles, so I work with empowering them. It doesn't matter nearly how someone else responds. Yeah. You get to choose how you feel about yourself. You get to choose whether you judge yourself or not. And if yeah. you don't judge yourself, then you're going to be okay. Yeah. If you don't judge yourself, then you're going to be in a completely different space mentally and emotionally than if you take on that judgment and continue judging yourself. And yeah. what people don't realize is in no one, and no, it's a little bit controversial, but no one can make you feel a certain way. You have to buy right. into it and choose to judge yourself. Right. And it's really difficult because it's we get difficult. stuck in these paradigms and these yeah. limiting beliefs. I know for myself, I've been in Shaduchim for eight years. And so I've had my fair share of ups and downs. Yeah. Like I kind of got thrown into it because where I learned in Square, it was like, you know, after Paisach, the, the class opens and everybody just, just starts writing Shaduchim. Yeah. And you have Shatchanam calling you because they want to basically try to help you or make money over you. So it's just yeah. random ideas coming, even though I was never even ready to get into Shaduchim. So I do agree. Mm -hmm. It's very true what you're saying that. If, if I believe, if I look at myself eight years in Shaduchim and my entire class is married already, and most of them have children, so I am, like you said, a Nebuch. But then if I compare myself to, in, to the non-Jewish world or to the entire world, then you have an average age is, I think, 30 or 32 that right. people get married, and I'm right. 26. I'm just you're, you're way normal. below. I'm very, right. very young. Right. And I feel young. So I, I agree that the limiting belief is... is uh, 
But that being said, I feel the circumstances does set us up for failure. Because when you walk into shul and you don't wear a stramo, you know, for Hasidim, or when you're not married, there is that, that stigma, which I don't know if it's possible to, to change at all. If not, you know. We can't change other people, but we can look at it differently. We can say, I always say you're single by design, not by punishment. Wow. So there's a design happening. You're not forgotten. Hashem loves you. Right. And what I really have seen, having worked with hundreds, possibly thousands now of singles, is that the journey of being single is the journey that they need to go through to develop their greatest potential for wow. now. And everyone right. ends that journey at different times. Right. But none of us know when is the right time for each person to end that journey. Right. So when we look at it that way, that some people need to do their tikkunim and their growth within marriage and start from young, like 18, 19, right. and others specifically need to not do that and will grow more outside of marriage. Wow. Then you look at it, you zoom out and look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. That it's not about there's something wrong with you. And the proof, the proof that it's not about if there's something wrong with you if you're single is that there are tons and tons of dysfunctional couples that are married. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say. Like many, many right. really dysfunctional, unhealthy, right. God bless them, but they're married because they need that marriage to be the thing that's going to propel them to their growth, right? right? But Hashem's not looking down saying, oh, you're not healthy yet, you're not healthy yet. Only when you're at this level of health, I'm going to get you all married. It just doesn't happen that way. So who are we? It's such a gaiva, right? Such an arrogance to, to feel that I know why someone else is still single. Now, I want to say, there are ways we can get in our own way. There are issues we have to work on. There are blocks. That's all I work with. I work with that, the blocks to marriage and the fears that come up yeah. about marriage that can stand in your way and keep you close to marriage. They're all real. But still, we can't say that we're, we're like, we understand God's cheshben and understand yeah. what, where, why that person's not married. It's very right. arrogant. So it's a, new, it's a nuance. We have to be aware there's a complexity and as a single your only job is to make sure you're doing your maximum ishtadlis yeah. that you can not just practically but spiritually and and we'll go into it on the inner work yeah. right which is what i i love because i think it's the least talked about yeah. um and and make sure that you're an open vessel for it which is not wow. easy yeah i want to quote one of the things that you said on instagram uh -oh. a while ago and I found it so valuable and useful. And I use it, but I've, I've done research because I've followed you for a very long time, even before we ever messaged or got to know each other. You said that if somebody comes over to you, but any simcha, and tells you anything about your shidduch <laughs> or what you need to do or what you need to be, just tell them God has a plan for me. And that's been a game changer. You it used works. It? I used it yes. so many times especially on my grandparents because wow. they i love them deeply of course but they are a grandparent they care so much they they get blinded they're like i just want to see you engaged they, yeah but when you tell them those words yeah god has a plan for me there is no comeback what, what do they say yes they're like yeah you're that's right true. Yeah. <laughs> no it's amazing Everyone, and you could of course but i found that in marriage this just works so well and I think that that's, that's the bottom line of everything. That makes me so happy because that is the reason I do this work because I want to empower singles. Yeah. And that is the truth. And a lot of the other pressure and judgment we get comes from fear. Comes from fear. Your right. grandparents love you. They want to see you married. They're scared that you're unhappy. Right. Yeah. They don't want you to be unhappy. So of course they want good for you. But if when we all buy into the fear, we create more fear. Wow. And so if you hold, stand strong, and yeah. look, I always say look at them straight in the eye, yeah. whoever it is, and say, don't worry, God has a plan right. for me too. So, so let's go into fear, because I had this yeah. realization yesterday that clearly I have tremendous fear around marriage. And I said that proudly, because if I have the fear, I know what I'm feeling and I know what I can right. work on. But the fear is very clearly, there is, they, they say the divorce rate is at 50%. In our community, I think it's around 20%, 10 or 20%, 30%. I'm not exactly sure, it depends on which area. So, and I know fear of rejection is kind of the story of my life. I feel like that's mm -hmm. my biggest fear and that's, that's what's been happening to me, especially because of my business or a little bit, you know, of being famous a little bit. So that's kind of been my pattern growing up, being famous and then rejected. So I, I clearly feel that there is a fear of getting into a marriage, being very happy, really loving it and enjoying it. But then a few years later, there is the fear of rejection. I get rejected. It doesn't work out. Um, and then I get into the big mess. And I think that that's a fear that also 
relates to a lot of other people. They, they, they look around and they're like, why should I take the chance of getting married? Mm. Whether they know this consciously or subconsciously, mm -hmm. why should I take the chance of getting married when there's such a big chance that I might get divorced, then deal with children back and forth, courts, beds and stuff like that. There is a lot to fear, clearly. The best things in life can also be the worst things in life, right? On the other side of fear, there is is love, right? So, right. So how do how, how would somebody like me work with that fear? Okay, that's a big question and a common question and okay. a common issue. Okay, you're not alone. Lots Thank of you. people have fear, <laughs> and and there's two levels to there's two levels of working with this. Number one is on the practical level because that's easier to sort of address. Is that Rejection and, and failure in marriage doesn't just happen to you. You have to be an active, willing participant in the failure of your marriage. Wow. I know that's very controversial. Oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble. Look what you bring. You bring this out of people, you know, this, this realness. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to get in trouble. But I have fear now. But, uh, but, but it doesn't just happen to people. No. Divorce doesn't just happen. It's not like poof, you're divorced or poof, it's a failure or just all of a sudden you're rejected. It's a process right. and it's a constant choice of how to respond in your marriage that leads to the damaging of a marriage, right? It's a yes. constant choice. So if you choose, I want to be growth oriented, I want to be committed to making a happy marriage, I'm going to get advice, aids, input, whatever it is when we need it. I'm going to be humble enough to know that I have issues and can contribute to something that's maybe a negative thing and say sorry and, well, and give forgiveness. If you have all those elements, the raw materials, right? Yeah. I'm growth. I want to see the good in my partner. I want to be able to build. I want to be able to say sorry. I want to come back. I want to learn from other people. Then it's less likely. It's very, wow. very, very much. So you're saying acceptance, but also having a knowing that if you do the right thing, yeah, then it's most surely gonna gonna work out. Yeah, like you're gonna choose someone else with the same values right. as you. Right. Uh, that they wanna that they believe in building a marriage and that takes work to build a marriage. It doesn't just right. happen. You're not a victim. Right. And I think we need to get out of victim mode, whether it's victim being single, like I'm just waiting around for it to happen and it's not happening and I can't do anything about it. Right. That's not true. And also a victim in marriage. It doesn't just happen that you suddenly have a bad marriage and you get rejected. I love what you said about so number one, accepting that things might go wrong. Is that what you, just, what you said? Things might go wrong in a marriage and that's okay to accept, like whether it's very, very wrong or just a little bit wrong? There's lots of things that are going to go wrong, but we have to make a commitment to being growth oriented. Right. And when you're growth oriented and you, know, you understand that marriage comes with work, right. marriage comes with mistakes, marriage comes with forgiveness, right. and you, you're setting yourself up for success. You're setting yourself up for having a good marriage, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's important to choose someone with the values that are the same. We know what raw materials it, may, it takes to have a good marriage. We know it's not some big mystery, like I'm going to choose some random person and I have no idea what I'm getting. No, no, no. Right. Through the dating process, you have to right. speak to each other and find out what the values. Now, the problem often is lack of communication. Right. I, I don't actually speak the honest truth and it's everything's pretend and superficial. I call it the Bruch Hashem syndrome. Yeah. You know? <laughs> How are you doing? Bruch How are you doing? Bruch Hashem. Bruch Hashem. No, no, my house on fire. Bruch Hashem. Bruch Hashem. No, like we now that Hashkafer, I understand that it really everything's from Hashem and everything's good. But if we're not holding there and we're not real, right, right. then it's fake. Right. And, we, and if we're fake, then we're not dealing with what's really there. Right. Okay. So, so let's important. so let's get down to the basics. Um, what type of person does one have to become? Like. If I were to date and I, if I were to be, you speak, you work a lot more with girls. You have a lot of followers from both, but you work with a lot of girls. So you would definitely know what they are looking for. What would be, I know the answer for myself, but what would be the perfect um, ideal man for, for an average girl? What does that man have to do or be, obviously, or become to be in a perfect position for marriage? He has to be, he has to be willing to take care and carry a family, like responsibility, protection, providing, feel a sense of accomplishment in being in making her happy. Right. And how does he know if he just says it or if he really is it? Uh, through how he treats her and how he treats other people and how he talks about other people. And wow. whether he's even in the dating process, you can see, you know, I always encourage my my women that I work with 
to give the guy a compliment, like give the guy, like say, thank you so much. That was such a thoughtful idea. Or thank you so much for, for, for taking care of me or taking me home or whatever it is. And really give the compliment and see how he reacts to that. Right. You know, usually that makes a guy feel a million bucks if they're healthy, right. if they did something good. And a, a healthy man will want to be, a healthy man feels his best when he's making his woman happy. You know, wow. that, that must be a macabre flow. Right. right. So being mashpia is the masculine and makabel is the feminine and they go together as a, as a connection, especially when you're dating in that, in that specific type of relationship. You know, we see that, that that energy is the energy through the whole of the world, right? The sun is the mashpia, the moon is the makabel. The sun is the masculine, the moon is the feminine. It receives the sunlight and reflects it back. And they work together as a unit. They must work together. Right. And the moon is waiting for the sun's light and absorbs the light and then lights up the tides and governs the tides and lights up the moon, sorry yeah. I should say. And then the, the rain is considered masculine. Yeah. Mother Earth is feminine. Right. So rain comes down, Mother Earth absorbs the rain and sprouts vegetation. Right. And then you have ma men give to women and women receive in the womb and bear a child. It's the same flow. So that flow happens on the emotional level as well. Right. And even on a date, even when you're not committed yet, that's the flow we want to set up. Is Mashpia right. Makabel. So if a woman, I work with the women on receiving. Often right. a woman doesn't like to receive, don't want to be open, they don't want to be vulnerable, right. they don't want to go there. So the bond doesn't happen. Right. But a man has to step up and be in that leadership role as well and feel confident enough right. to take on that leadership role and take care and wow. provide and, and guide and lead and make decisions. Guys, if you're setting up a date yourself, make the decision yourself. A woman loves it when a man makes a decision. Right. If the, yeah. if, if the man says to the woman, well, what do you want to do? The woman doesn't like that generally. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean don't get input and don't get opinions. So that's not what I'm saying. You work together. But the, when the man takes that leadership role, most women love that. Yeah. I recently thought, like, I feel like congratulations to every girl because I've only been on the man side and I know that I, we go and pick up a girl. Yeah. But I don't know how girls really trust. Like, you, see, they're sitting in the car potentially for two or three hours or more, they really have to trust. Right. That takes it's vulnerable. Guts. Yeah. yeah. It's very vulnerable. It is. Like I know for myself, like if I, in the middle, if anything happens, if I get triggered or something, I just drive home. For her, she's sitting in the car. She's like, oh God, how am I going to Uber? Like, what? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it does take guts. And I understand yeah. why, why every fifth girl is, is on a break right now because... Because well, it takes Dave guts for both. It takes guts for both. It takes guts for the man to step up and into that leadership role and make decisions. Because what if it's the wrong one? And what if she doesn't like it? Right. And what if she's going to reject me? Rejection, right. That's right. a big one. That's a big one. And then the woman is like, I don't know. I don't know if I trust this guy. I don't know if I can be vulnerable with it. Like, there's they're different. They're different challenges that right. go together. Right. But we have to work on it. That's part of it. So just going back to the beginning, because what I think is really important, and I don't know if we got through it, is the how you approach being single. How you approach being single is very, very important, that it's part of your journey, it's part of your plan that Hashem is designing for you to become the best version of yourself. Right. And if you, if you zoom out and say some people have to do that work inside of marriage more and I have to do it outside of marriage for a while, then you don't feel like a nebach. Right. The whole point is you don't, you're not a loser, right? You're here on purpose, you're, you're loved, you're lovable, you're good, and you have to believe that in yourself because if you don't, you can't date well. Right. You won't date from your best self. So what's the best way to be single and productive? It's to say, it's, I've got to work on myself. There's two areas to work on. Okay. One is with me and me, Ben Adam Latzma, mm -hmm. and one is me and Hashem. And a lot of people focus on, I've got to do the practical Hishtadlis, practical effort. I've got to do the spiritual effort, tefillah, prayer, right. betachon, trust. But then very few people do that. I've got to do the inner, the inner work. Meaning, what do I mean? We're a vessel to receive from Hashem. We can stand in our own way because of those fears. So part of the work, I believe, it's my two cents, if it doesn't resonate, reject it. <laughs> but part of, what, part of the work and part of the, the tikkun that we're meant to do is to, is to address those fears. And it's only coming up because you're single and you wanna get married so badly that it's triggering the fear. So right. you get to see it, it's like a mirror. Yeah. So I call it a mirror moment. When there's a mirror moment, when your life is triggering a certain fear, a certain wound, a certain insecurity, that's good because that's very clearly what you need to work on as part of your bigger tikkun. Wow. And so it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that's what's right with you to work on. Right. You have to work on that. And the question is, how do you work on it? And most people don't. They just shove it down and pretend everything's fine. Baruch Hashem. 
right? Most people do that. Most people just shove it down. Baruch Hashem, everything's great. I'm yeah. perfect. And they go out <laughs> on the dates, right? I'm a perfect date. I, I always say that there's that perfectionism wall, right? Yeah. I'm a perfect date. Or there's the quiet wall. Right. I'm not going to talk. Right. Right? So I, I was thinking about this yesterday. Like, I, I love working on myself, obviously. And I'm, I'm very into learning and, and meditation and reading books and Yiddish books. Not, yeah, not Yiddish books. But then how does a person really know, in your opinion, how does a person really know if they're actually making progress and they're healing? Mm. If they're in enlightenment or they're just into that denial stage that everything is perfect? Because whatever triggered you originally doesn't trigger you as much. And it happens slowly, slowly, slowly that yeah. you get triggered less. Right. And then it suddenly, eventually dissolves. Wow. Okay. That's, that's, that's I'll give you an powerful. example personally because we get personal on this podcast, right? We, yes. We, go, we get real about our growth, which I love yeah. about you because you role model that for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. You role model as a single doing this work. And I think that that's a very big thing. Thank and it's you. a brave thing. It. It's a very brave thing and it's courageous. And it's really what we're doing here on the planet to grow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I really respect that. And and I think that um, I just had a mental block. Boop. What was I just saying? An example. Oh, thank you. Um, so my father died when I was young. And obviously, you know, it was it was a whole trauma I had to work through. And when I was younger, I was more anxious, like when dating, let's say. Mm -hmm. Very anxious. And that would they they were the shrinks were called that an abandonment issue because my dad literally died. Okay. Right. I worked on it a lot throughout my life. Yeah. And after about a year or two of being married, Baruch Hashem, um, it dawned on me that I don't have that anymore. Wow. It dawned on me that I don't get triggered by that. And it does. I don't have it. Right. Why? Because I worked on it. So I know that that's what happens. It just doesn't show up in your life anymore, those right. triggers, when you work on it. And so firstly, the step is owning it. And the second step is then noticing that it starts to reduce. It sort of just refines and refines and refines and it integrates into the rest of you. Wow. When you work on an issue and then you move right. on. Don't worry. You move on to new issues. You move on to the next level. You move on to also you become a more of a Kalia vessel right. to do your purpose in the world when right. you work on that stuff. Yeah, I agree because I, it, it bothers me a lot when I can't see myself doing a specific thing. Mm. Like, as I mentioned, after my friend Mahul passed, I, I couldn't date. I was just maybe I could, but I didn't feel like it. Right. I was really grieving and I was so sad and upset. Yeah. And I didn't see a possibility or the, the energy to go out and date. And I feel like that's something that still happens to me many times where there's like a mental blockage or maybe I can mm. call it a brain fog towards a specific thing that just blocks us. And how, how do you feel with that? When you talk to people, do, is that a common thing that comes up? They're like, I want to, I want to get married, but I just feel I can't see that possibility happening. Right. So this is where we introduce the subconscious. Wow. The subconscious is the part of the brain that we're not aware of. You just helped me a lot, by the way. Why? Because I, I feel like I have this problem. I feel like consciously I want to right. want Wanted. to date. I want to get into, get into a marriage. I want to live in my own house and build a family. But subconsciously, there's something literally just holding me back. Correct. That's exactly right. That's called normal, okay. so, conscious and subconscious. Thank so you. What so happens, how do we do the work? Yeah. So what happens is there's a subconscious part of the brain, which is the part of the brain we're not aware of. By definition, we're not aware of it. Yeah. And it's an amazing thing that Hashem gave us to, that, to store things, like a back filing cabinet. We store everything in there yeah. from when we are little. And when things were too emotional or too difficult, it doesn't even have to be extreme trauma. It can be normal stuff, right? It doesn't have to be extreme. We'll store it there because we don't know how to process it or deal with it. And then what happens in life as you get older is it wants to be resolved. It wants to be dealt with because yeah. it takes energy. It's, it's draining. It's exhausting to store stuff and keep it there subconsciously. Even though you're not aware of it, it takes your energy. So right. the, the, the thing that my clients first feel when they start working on this stuff is they feel energized. I feel lighter. Wow. I feel because it takes a heaviness to do that, right? So what happens is, is you have certain belief systems that, that form based on our experiences over our lifetime. Let's say rejection. That's a really common one. So let's take that one. Let's say I grew up and uh, there was two siblings that were closer and I always felt left out. Normal dynamic. This is normal. Okay. 
let's say I felt rejected a lot of the time. I wanted to play with them and they didn't want me around. I was annoying. I was the annoying little sibling. So often I start feeling rejected, but I was rejected. It was true. That's what was happening. Yeah. Of course they love me, but like I was rejected. Then I go to school and I get a group of friends and at some point they think I'm a bit nerdy and they don't want to sit with me one lunchtime. Ah, I get rejected again. And these feelings of rejection feel horrible to a little child. And so they store it up in their subconscious. Because consciously they're coming out. Consciously is basically the, the brain that makes decisions right now in the moment. So consciously they are still fighting it and they're going out there and they're trying yeah. to be funny. But the subconscious brain is the brain that teaches us that it already knows how to eat or it already knows how to go to the bathroom. Like that doesn't, it's not active. It's automatic. It's automatic. So you're saying that automatically it gets stores that I'm a rejection, even though on the outside, they're not acting like a rejection. Correct. They're still pretending as if right. they this are a king. Right, this is deep, deep inside, wow. and it becomes like a wound. Right. And we store that wound away, but the belief system that starts to develop from that wound is, I'm not lovable. Right. I'm going to be rejected. Yeah. Because I have experience that I was rejected. Okay. So that belief system now is in the subconscious, and it starts to drive over 80% of our knee-jerk reactions and our automatic responses in life. Wow. 80 Eight zero, And if I don't address that wound on some level, because what happens is I start to reject myself. I start to feel that I'm a reject. So I will respond to myself that way. I won't really valid validate myself. I won't listen to myself. I won't, won't find I'm worthy. Um, and, and that plays out. And then what happens is, is there's a thing called the reticular activating system, which is like a radar. And it goes through your life looking for situations where it says, see, I knew I'd be rejected or it yeah. looks for situations sort of similar yeah. where and you go in, let's say a date. So how I deal with it with dating is uh, someone will say I'm scared of rejection. So what do they do on a date? They go on a date and because they're scared of rejection in advance already, they put up a big wall. So they're not, they're not going to reveal themselves because they're scared of rejection. So they put up a protection, obviously. Right. And what happens? The other person says, listen, really nice person, but I couldn't feel a connection. So I'm going to end it. So she gets rejected. And she says, see, I always get rejected. Right. And we call that self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It's because I'm already preempting it and expecting it because it's in my subconscious that I put that out in the world and that's actually what comes back to me. Wow. It's an unbelievable idea. That, and the good news is, is that we then can have control over that. So when someone comes to me, the first thing I ask them is, Ellie, what are your patterns in dating? Right, you already told me because you're self-aware. Sometimes people don't know. But I'll, I'll say, what are your patterns in dating? Do you get no dates? Do you always get rejected? Do you get bad dates as in not aligned? Or do you get um, dates, good dates, but you can't deepen the connection? There would be like the top three. Yep. I, um, yeah. So first of all, that's wow what you just said. And let me use my skill to sum it up that many people, the reason why they can't see, I'm a different person right now because it just clearly answers my, my own awarenesses and my own where I am in my life right now. Mm. Sometimes a person can't see themselves go out there and date or be successful, but this goes for money or whatever it is, or if you're in a relationship. And that is because consciously, of course, you're doing the effort, you're doing the work, mm -hmm. but subconsciously you are so stuck and your, work, your entire life is based on a pattern and you have limiting right. beliefs um, blocking you. That's it. I think this is Not like, just that, there's well, an inner tension. Right. There's the con conscious mind wants something, the subconscious is trying to protect you right. from something. Right. And the subconscious will win, always. Right, right, uh, of always course. Always will win. So unless you address the subconscious level, which is where, again, I'm gonna get into trouble, but a lot of therapists fall short. Yeah. A lot of therapists are lovely, well-meaning people and they can help you get insight and they can help you get an analysis about dynamics and they can help you be aware of patterns, but, but they, they don't change. address the subconscious level. How do I know that? Because a lot of my clients will say, Jackie, I've done therapy and I know what my issues are. I know where they come from. I know why they're there, but I can't change how I feel. Right. Because the feelings, and this is key, the feelings in the body are expressed from the subconscious. Conscious. The body is subconscious. The body is the subconscious, right? The body keeps the score is a very good yes, book. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, if you want to understand this more, it's not a Jewish book, so filter as needed. But it is a fantastic book that describes this. The Sarno method is also very popular, and that also talks about the subconscious. There's a lot of modalities that will approach the subconscious. So if you're wow. working with a therapist and you feel it's not moving, say thank you very much, trust your gut, 
and move on to a different one or a different yeah. coach or whoever it is who can work right. at the subconscious. And the second part that you said, which is extremely important, and this goes also for every area in our life, is that whatever we attract, whatever mm. we see, is literally coming to us based on our subconscious mind. Yes. So yeah. I've had a business coach that asked me about a year ago. She asked me, you know, Ellie, you're so successful. You built such a successful company. Because we have. Yeah. Right? I have a social media company and we have many clients and yeah. many employees, by wow. the way. And the companies are doing great. They're seeing great results to the online market. You know, they're not missing out on that. The employees are getting paid, so they're making a living. I have what to do. Like, she's like, she told me, you, you have such a successful business. Why can't you have that success in marriage? Mm. Well, now, of course, I know the answer. But I remember that there was a specific, but the answer is obviously that the limiting belief subconsciously. And I could, I, I was able to see for a while that the girls that I was, that I was attracting were extremely pretty, um, which is obviously what I put a focus on. They were also very caring and loving, but at a certain point they would say, okay, I need to break up with you now. It's time for me to go, whatever. And now that I found that very interesting because I knew at that time I didn't know, but later on I knew that I was the one attracting these kind of things. Mm. I was looking for an unhealthy person that's mm. obviously pretty because that was the only thing that yeah. mattered at that point that then would say, okay, no, I'm reject. You know, so, so I love seeing whatever uh, is happening in my life will be an indicator yes. of what's happening inside. You got it. Whether it's the That's business it. opportunities. Yes. So in business, what I did was I consciously told myself, because now that's my follow-up question, how do we reprogram the subconscious? But if I can go first, I know that the main way to reprogram the subconscious mind is to do conscious work. Um, and consciously put ourselves into a position that works for us or mm -hmm. telling us consciously different things or doing mirror work or, or uh, affirmations mm -hmm. is a very big one telling yourself over and over again what you deserve and what you want. And that worked for me in business. Mm. At a certain point, it was more likely that I will make money by mistake than not make money at all. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like my, my conscious was stop reprogramming the subconscious mind that we're going to be successful. It's going to work out. A new client will come. They will give you a deposit. And that's been going for me for now two years. Beautiful. My question is, how in your work, how do we reprogram that subconscious mind? Or if you want to get personal, I'm willing to do it. I, how do I reprogram my subconscious mind that will tell me that, Ellie, it's okay. You're not going to get rejected. You can go into, into marriage, into living with, uh, with your wife and feel happy, calm and at ease and have the feeling that you deserve. So how do we reprogram yeah. that subconscious? Great. Okay, so the Talmud says we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we yeah. are. Wow. So that's, we have a lens, like you said, and we look out from the lens and we think it's about out there, but really it's about in here. So that's the first thing is to see what in your life is a pain point. Yeah. What in your life is a conflict? What in your life is a pattern? That's step one. Step two, if, you, if you're willing and game, I would coach you now on, on spot. Okay. If you want to do it. Yes. And we can, you can edit out whatever you want, right? Yeah, if we, go for it. Yeah. So... Because as we said before, the way I coach and help you shift it at your own level, firstly, you don't know if you're going to be rejected by someone else. The, pro the reason why it's so painful is because on some level you're rejecting yourself. Yes. There's a wound in yourself that's open to their rejection and then you'll reject yourself too and that's the most painful. Yeah. And so if we get to a point where we don't reject ourselves and we actually have real self-love and self-worth, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much. Obviously, you don't want your wife, you don't want to reject you, but I'm saying at the end of the day, even in, in marriage, you should just know that there's lots of times in, in your marriage where someone's in a bad mood, you feel rejected, you know, you, you, they right. didn't say the right thing. There's lots of examples of that where you could feel rejected. Right. You don't want to have that as a big fat wound in the marriage. No, it's terrible because it's going to make you react and trigger. So the way to change that anyway, whether it's single or in marriage, because a lot of people have these wounds in marriage. Right. You're just, you've got the benefit of working on it outside yeah, of marriage. Was, yeah. 100%. I love That's it. That's why I really say to singles, work on it now. It's so much harder in marriage because right. you've got the whole home to run and you've got your husband there and you've got the, you know, it's yeah. much harder. So like we said before, the subconscious speaks through the body. Yeah. So I would ask you, when you are scared of rejection, how do you experience that in your body on a sensation level? Allow it I was very happen. impressed. 
Men usually don't like to do that. And so I, I only went there because I felt you would go there. People don't realize is the biggest thing that keeps us stuck is what I'll call self-rejection. Self-rejection we do in three or four main ways. One is what you mentioned, suppression. I'm just going to push it down and it works. Right. It works to push it down, but it doesn't work to help you grow. And yeah. it doesn't work to help you shift. Right. Self-rejection keeps us stuck. I can suppress my feelings. I can escape my feelings into work, into food, into Netflix, into whatever, internet, into exercise. You can use anything as an escape, right? So I can, I can suppress my feelings. I can escape. I can blame myself or others. Once I go into blame mode and victim mode, I'm stuck. Yeah. And the last one, which is really common, is judgment. When I judge myself, judgmentally, meaning negative judgment, I'm going to stay stuck. I'm not going to be open to change. So what we did just now, for example, with this process with you was we went in with compassionate curiosity. Oh, right. that's interesting. Tell me more about that right. to the chest. Right. Let, me, let me understand it more. So when we go in with compassionate curiosity, we can change. Even if your judgment is true about yourself, if it's coming with a negative judgmental right. feeling, you're going to stay stuck. Right. So they are the four things we want to start to shift. Right. Getting on, out of our own way. Right. So on, and on a day-to-day -day basis, what's the best way to, to, to reprogram a healthy subconscious? Be in tune with your body and be curious about it. Mm -hmm. Be going, oh, what, do I, what am I sensing right now? How do I feel? What, what do I feel I want? What do I feel I need? And will that give somebody deep healing for their subconscious? No, they have to find the wounds. So the, the best way to do deep healing with your subconscious is to see what number one triggers you. Right. And that's the wound. So that's the wound that needs to be worked with. I don't think the average person can do it on their own. I think they need help. Wow. I do right. think they need help. Could you have done not, that on your own? No. No. If not, they're just going to go wherever they want to yeah, go. Yeah, they don't know how, they don't know, they don't know what it, also, if you never had role modeling of compassionate curiosity. Right. If you didn't know what that means and you don't know how to respond to yourself. Right. With a certain level of acceptance and love. Then how can you right. just do that? So the, I'm sure you know Esther Perel. Yes, I love okay, her. Okay, yeah, she's awesome. And she has this one line that I found truth. I said it actually on our latest uh, episode with also Ashatran. And she says that people always says they say that you have to love yourself before you get into a marriage, but it's impossible. How do you, how do you love yourself? For what? For who? Like, and when you have somebody that loves you, you learn how you can be lovable. Do you agree with that? I think both are true, meaning that does happen, but I don't think it, you, can, you can come from ground zero. I think if you have a wound that you are not lovable, someone right. else uh. is not going to teach you to be lovable because that wound is going to always play out. I don't think you have to get it perfect. Right. I don't think you have to be perfectly self-loving, but there's a certain level of self-worth, self-acceptance, self-value that if you don't have... Right you're going to tolerate treatment from someone else in a negative way because right. you don't feel that way. Like you have to build a certain sense of self. Right. Let's put it that way. Well, I'm, I'm kind of looking for magic, to be honest. Like I, I have, a, a, something tells me that I, I might never feel like I'm 100% ready. And it's just gonna happen despite my doubt or, or not feeling it or what? 80-20. Yeah, oh, that's the rule? That's, that's the rule. Works. 80, if you're 80% ready, then you're good to go? If, if it's 80% good with someone, marry right. them. And what do you say to all the people that say that I'm on a break? When do you think, does it, do you think it's real that people need a break and they should take a break? If they're really burnt out and they can't face dating, then it's good to take a break and focus on other activities, other things that give you hiss and passion and right, interest. Right, just get that spark But for, we're talking a couple weeks, not months and months and months. Right. You know, like go and take a break. Like don't think about dating for two, three weeks, you know, and, and then come back to it. Like what, what do you, it's what you do on the break. It's not just the break. Right. Now I'm curious, um, what, what do you think, how does the dynamic change when it's a second marriage? Um, you know, people that are divorced and they want to get engaged again. Um, what changes? In a sense, they have that experience. They know what marriage is about. How do they get their self-worth, first of all? And second of all, how do they, how do they pursue um, finding a happy marriage again when they've been so hurt? So the divorce rate is higher for second marriage. Mm -hmm. Much higher, actually. Okay. And part of that, again, I'm just theorizing. I have no idea. But part of that 
I think, is because a lot of times people think the second marriage is the cure-all for the first. Oh, wow. And or it's just, according to what you said, they're probably repeating a pattern. And they're repeating a pattern. I had a shakhan who's made hundreds of shidduchim. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of shidduchim. She's very real. And she said, just quietly, she said in passing one day, she said in all her years, like 30 years of doing this, she said that she's seen that people play out the same exact tikkunim in the wow. second marriage. You can't outrun your tikkun. You wow. can't out trick God or you can't, it, yes, it can be better in the second marriage because you start from, a, a, you know, starting again, a reset, but the same themes and patterns will play out. Right. So it's better to work on yourself and stick it out. Are you out. talking about when you say tikkun, you mean like a bigger picture? You mean like I have a purpose? Uh, tikkun and, is more like I, I have a correct. No, tikkun is like I have a, I have a, a correction to make in myself. Wow. An issue. Tikkun is a correction, right? Yeah. A fixing. Yeah. So there's certain things on that we're all here to fix in our neshama that needs fixing. Right. Right. The Gemara says that there's hints to your tikkun what it is. Okay. That one hint is there's a certain desire that we have that is harder to resist than other desires. So wow. whether it's food, whether it's lust, whether it's fame, whether yeah. it's money, whether it's comfort, adventure, whatever the, the, the taiva is, yeah. there's certain desires we have. And one of those is harder for each one of us to resist than the other. Wow. All right. Okay. My name's Yocheved yeah. in Hebrew. Okay. So Yocheved comes from Yud and Kavod, right? Yocheved is Kavod. Yes. So at a very young age, I was also put into the fame, into the limelight, okay. right? I was on a national TV as a, as a resident psychologist on the, oh, wow. on, in a show in Australia. And I was tested with that fame. It was in my name, yeah. right? Covered. And then as I got older and I became observant, I was Belta Bala and Bala Chiva. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I really had, I really realized that the, the tikkun here is, am I going to, ser- am I going to be use the fame for myself yeah. or the fame for Hashem? Am I going to glorify wow. Hashem's name or am I glorifying my name? And that, that was my tikkun or right. that is my tikkun in my, yeah. in my name. Well, but how do you think girls, um, see, see fame or see what's see my fame? I think it depends on the girl. And I think it's more about whether the fame is, is blinding you right. from, the, from well, reality. Yeah, for a while I felt like my fame is a good reason to reject me. And that's really what happened. Um, but and now I feel like I've changed that perspective, that inner view. And I feel like, no, it's another reason to respect me. And that's actually the results that I'm mm. seeing in my life. I very much tested and played with these kind of things to try to attract and manifest specific... Um, I would say dates, and it really worked every time. Uh, I'll tell you the most recent that I did was, for example, um, I deleted dating apps. And interestingly, what happened is because, you know, when you shift energy, you would know this when I deleted those apps, because I noticed that, uh, yes, I got a lot of matches, but they weren't anything really for me. Just none of them were, because there's no, I'm looking for Hasidish girl, and there's no Hasidish girl on those dating apps. The moment I deleted that app, I think I was read about seven or eight shadikham through WhatsApp and phone calls. One was as recent as last week, um, Sha- uh, this week Shabbos. Somebody just ran. You wow. know, you think sometimes Shabbos nobody can call you, but somebody came to Davin in our house. We have a minion Friday night, and he read me a shidduch. So it just comes to show within five days of deleting the dating apps, uh-huh. I got six or seven regular shadikham, chasidish girls. So I very much believe in that, that when you make a shift, a conscious shift in effort yes. and an energy, that things really change. Yes. We, well, we're, we're a vessel. Right. So where, where, where we can choose where we align our vessel right. with. Are we aligning it with the dating apps? Are we aligning it with the shem? Exactly. Are we, where are we aligning it, right? They say most people when they get engaged is at that point that they get engaged, is they get engaged when they really want to get engaged. Have you found that to be true? I don't know what that means. A sense of readiness, a sense of belief. I don't know what readiness means. I don't know. I mean, I I think it's it's a very vague word. And how do you define readiness? You You have to be willing to be a giver. You have to be willing to focus on someone else other than yourself. These, yeah. are, these are more the signs of readiness and you have to want to build something bigger than you. Yeah. That's healthy marriage. A lot of people come to marriage from a place of lack. Yeah. 
I want them to make me feel good. Right. I want them to make me look good. I want them right. to because I want to be normal for society or whatever it is. Yeah. That's all taking and that's all very immature. Well, well, I've had actually the opposite experience that I feel like I'm here to take care of myself. That's the first step. The next step will be extension will be take care of your wife and right. your kids. But because I feel like sometimes I'm in survival mode in terms of taking care of mm. myself, so how do I now take care of a wife and kids? Does that make sense? I'm, I'm so focused on taking care of myself that taking care of others will be a challenge. Right, so you might not be ready yet. Depends what that means, well, what that looks like. And what, what do you mean by so focused? Meaning if you have a wife in your house and you're doing whatever you're doing to make a Parnassa and whatever, that will take care of her, obviously. You right, know? true. So it's wanting, it's wanting to be a unit with someone, wanting to have a, a, some, like a someone by your side. Now, a woman comes with her co-host too, right? So right. together, when you're not having to like look after the home and, and whatever, wherever you're living and doing whatever you're doing for yourself, you have a, you have a teammate in a way, right? right? So in some ways it's easier because you split that, you split that role, however you split it. Um, but on another hand, we want to both go into marriage feeling like we're both givers. And if you both go in with that attitude, it's amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's not, it, yeah, it, it, that's, that's really the mindset. And, and, you know, again, I want to tap on, touch on uh, Hashem, because we haven't really mentioned Hashem much. And usually I go crazy and talk about Hashem all the time. Uh, but really Hashem, we really want to give power to Hashem. Really, really, but in the heart. And it's not really just saying, I trust Hashem. It's really feeling that Hashem has my back. And that's the difference is that it's reliance. It's not just trust. If anyone hasn't joined Michael Safdie's uh, daily Batachon WhatsApp groups, please join it. It changed our lives. And I sent hundreds of people to his groups, but 10 minutes a day of focusing on dripping, dripping, dripping this sense of reliance on Hashem, that it's not just when I'm trusting Hashem, I'm relying on Hashem. So what, what's an example of that? Let's say your mom, God forbid, needs medicine and you're working, you're too busy and you have your best friend who's a powerhouse best friend type, you know, those powerhouse doers. Yeah. And you call your best friend, you say, I, and she, he lives near your, your mom. And you say, I'm so sorry, my mom needs medicine. Could you please do me a huge chesed and go down to CVS and buy me medicine and drop it at my mom's house? This is the medicine she needs. And he says, oh, I'm busy, but yes, I can fit it in between one and two, no problem. Thank you so much. I owe you. You're amazing. I love you. Whatever. You hang up the phone. You know, unless there's some national emergency, he's going to do it because he's that tight. Yeah. What's the feeling you feel when you hang up the phone? In your body. Grateful. Grateful. And what about the fact that your mom's going to get medicine? Um, I feel excited accomplished meaning like it's going to um, happen yeah it's going to happen do you feel like you need to keep checking up on him no right he's got it covered yeah i feel usually a sense of relief as well yeah oh it's taken care of it's not it's off my shoulders yeah it's on his shoulders right yeah. and i can i can let go of it because i know he's got it right that's the feeling we should be walking around with we should do him wow i'm doing my ashtadlas but hashem's got my back right in my heart i'm re i'm relaxed Right. I, I, I agree. I feel like so many singles or so many times for myself, my entire day revolves around the fact that I'm single and looking for a shadda. Right. Right. And worrying about and, it. Uh, yeah. Worrying. And, and that's a direct conflict with having the tochen. Exactly. Hashem. So yeah. listen, no one's on that level. We're all working on it. Right. However, that's, that's where we're going. That's what it should feel like. And if you don't feel that way, then you want to build it like a muscle. It's right. a muscle. Yeah. Every single day, I want you to work on where do I give power? Because wherever we give our power to, I'm at the mercy of, right? Whatever we give our power to, Hashem leaves us at the mercy of that thing. So I can live in the natural world or I can be in the supernatural. And when it comes to Shiduchim, we don't want to be in the natural world, right? We don't want to be in the natural with statistics and trends and the Shidduch crisis and whatever people think is going on. It's just me and Hashem. Wow. It's just me and Hashem, and, and Hashem, I'm in the supernatural realm with Hashem. He's having direct hashgacha on me, and I'm relying on Him. And that direct hashgacha increases to the degree that I give that power and that reliance to Hashem. For right. real, not just in theory, like in, for real. So we want to work on that for real. Wow. I really feel Hashem has my back. And it doesn't have to just be in Shidduchim. You could do it day to day as you're running around your day. You can be noticing how Hashem shows up in your life and saying, ah, there's Hashem, there's Hashem, there's Hashem. He's in my life. He's, in, he's taking care of me. I can be grateful to Hashem for everything, what I'm eating, what I'm wearing, what I'm doing, what everything I'm doing, Hashem has my back. So why would I think he doesn't have my back in this area? Yeah. But you have to extrapolate it away from Shidduchim. 
Yeah, I the mean, rest well, of your life. the only thing that I'm that I'm thinking when you say that is that yes, of course, Hashem, 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 but it's also the struggle is is on a day to day basis. Yes. I, the only thing I'm thinking now is you know we have Pesach coming up, and I feel like I know the Pesach is a difficult yomta for people. It's mm-hmm. a seven eight days, and being single is very hard. Whether they have children or they're mm-hmm. never married and they're just sitting at the table and they feel like yeah. Okay, you know, like I don't have my phone to distract myself. I don't have, I don't, can't work today. I can't go very far. I'm just wherever I am and here I am. You know, it, it, it kind of, I feel like it's a wound that burns. And I'm also going to answer the question that maybe, like you said, we have to subconsciously disconnect from whatever feeling that singleness is giving you. Make sense? No, say more. <laughs> I'm saying that whatever is feeling single, that feeling is you got to change that well you can you can hold the pain of being single and feel lonely but you don't have to buy into the judgment and the pressure and that you're not loved and that you've been forgotten and that Hashem doesn't love you I would say fill it up with Hashem fill it up with learning and chizuk and other things and again it depends how much your family pressure you but uh, you can also set boundaries that's another thing you can do it's like I don't want to talk about my dating I don't want to talk about focusing on my single singleness wow. And set boundaries with your family. You can also do that and say, listen, it really helps me if we don't talk about it. Would you mind? Wow. You know, and sometimes you're doing that, you feel so empowered that you actually... I I now understand why singles really like you. Because you seriously stand up for them. Yeah. You're like 100% on their side. That's because I was single for many years. So I get it. Wow. I got married very late. Wow. And I made a deal with Hashem and I said, if you get me married, I'll help singles. But thinking it will be just dabbling on the side if I could... Right. And it turned into a full time because it's so needed. Right. Because I understand wow. it. Wow. Because I'm I, I'm into empowering singles. You do not need to feel disempowered and judged and damaged and less than to be single and being going through this journey. It's 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 unbelievable to me how much pain there is on top of being single. Meaning, the OU did a study last year, and I think it was ninety percent of women feel the most of the pain of being single is from the community judgment and feeling ostracized, oh, wow. not from being single. Right. You're right. Yeah. It's a crazy, it's crazy, crazy statistics. That have a look up. You can look up the the thing online, but it's it's that that was by far the biggest shit of crisis was about how people feel because of the judgment and feeling like they're to blame for being single. Right. I want to ask you for a few short questions for the people that want like tachlas. Okay. What do you think is the number one indicator for a boy or a girl that they are ready? If they're doubting themselves, what's an indicator that they are ready to get into Shaduchim? That they have a sense of self-worth and self-acceptance and they want to have something bigger than just themselves in the world. That they're not coming from a place of lack mm-hmm. where I need someone else to make me feel better. I want to be loved by someone else so I feel good. That's a sign they're not ready. And the sign they are ready is to say that I'm ready to 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 give and build something bigger wow. than myself. Wow. What do you think is the best um, advice for a married couple that they feel they are struggling? What's something that can rekindle their relationship? Go and watch their wedding video again together. Really? To see that spark and energy that they had over there? It was an advice from a gadol. I can't remember which one. Wow. That when a couple was about to divorce, and just before they were going to divorce, they decided to stop off at the gadol's house. I love that. And the gadol, they said, do you have any advice for us? And he said, yes, I want you to try this exercise. I want you to sit on the couch together for the next week. And every night I want you to watch different parts of your wedding wow. video together. And they said, oh, that's, of course we've seen our wedding video. Yeah. And he said, just do it and come back to me in a week. That's so powerful. And they came back in a week and they were all different again. And it, what happened is they, they reconnected yeah. with the vision of what they had remembered they felt together at the yeah. beginning. So yeah. we forget, we lose touch with what we saw in each other when we first got married and the potential. Right. And so when you reconnect with the potential, you can start over again. Right. What should, what's the best location for a first date, in your opinion? Not a restaurant sitting opposite each other. So sit perpendicular, if, unless that's uncomfortable. If it's uncomfortable, don't do it. But sometimes sitting against on a corner, not right next to each other, but like not connected. When you're right. opposite, you go into interview style, right? right? It's like interview mode. Right. So sometimes it's better to walk side by side, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Walk side by side, looking at things, talking, sitting. You can sit down, you know, but not opposite. I don't right. know if that's done in your circles, yeah, 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 sure. But even in the car, I think is also yeah, exactly. Because everybody can just look yeah, out and just having yeah. the best 
Okay. What should somebody do if they're not getting any dates? I think there's probably 50% of people would ask this question. I'm not getting dates. What can I do? So, okay. Can I do tough love a little? Yeah. <laughs> if people aren't getting dates, then they're the common denominator of that pattern. That's a very wow. common pattern. Okay. Right. So it's not about blame, but it is about doing the hishtadlis of openly and honestly asking yourself, is there part of me that's scared? Wow. Is part of me wanted, but another part is scared of it, right. of getting married. Right. And if there's a part that's really scared of getting married, that can shut you down on some level that you're not really an open Kaylee for the flow of dating suggestions. Right. Just like you said, when you shut down the dating app, you opened up a Kaylee for, for other suggestions to come in. Yeah. So I can't tell you, again, I don't know how it works spiritually, right. but I can't tell you how often I've had people come in with that exact dating pattern. Yeah. They work on themselves with me. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're like, you're not going to believe this out of the blue. Some wow. random person from Israel I haven't spoken to her in a year. Yeah. She just called me and she had the best suggestion. I can't, yeah. I'm literally freaking out. I hear that all the time. And on a physical level, how do you think one should approach dating? What do you mean? Like how how does, how should they get a date? Do you believe in dating apps or, uh, or uh, on single events or shatchanam or reaching out to friends? What do you think is the all best of the way? above? I don't think there's one right way or okay. wrong way, but I will say, don't do something that makes you feel undignified. You don't have to do a shtadlis oh, wow. that makes you feel undignified. I never went to a singles event. Wow. I never went. For me, I just felt I couldn't be myself at a singles event. Right. And it didn't work for me, so I never made myself go. But I had to do other hishtadlas. Right. Whatever your hishtadlas is, do it. But you don't have to do everything, especially if you feel like it's degrading in some way. Or yeah. if, it, if it doesn't feel right for you, it's okay. Hashem doesn't need that app or that shatran right. or that event. Right? right? So neither do you. You don't need that anything specific. You just have to be doing hishtadlas. Do you think that it's possible to judge after a first date? Because some will judge too quickly. But some will definitely not judge at all and just go out and out and out because they don't want to say no. So how does somebody make a decision after a first if you, date? If they're good enough to get you out on a first date, as in it's compatible enough, yeah. you should go out unless you feel a repulsion or repelling away. Well, wow. So if you go out on a first date and you're like, this like that, then you can end it. But if, if you go out and it's parv, neutral, just keep going and it'll get clear. Yeah. And how important do you think attraction is? Very yeah. important. You can't marry someone if you're not, there's no chemistry at all. Do you think that... But attraction is not Hollywood attraction. Attraction is a draw. Uh, yeah, chaim. A, a draw. Is that the word? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. And how, do you think that it's okay for people to send pictures? I know people are very against pictures. It, what this do you is think about above my pay grade because it really depends on your community and your world. Right. And I think, I think in this day and age, it's unrealistic to think people won't. Right. Uh, and... I do think if someone was healthy and balanced and not objectifying people from the physical themselves and others, like they don't look at themselves that way or others that way, then a picture is useful because it gives you a sense of the person. But the problem is today we objectify people and purely judge them on the physical, right. which is not accurate. So people dismiss people based on the physical when they maybe shouldn't. So if someone's not healthy, it's not good. If someone's healthy, it can be helpful. Like I always want to see pictures of the dates of my clients because it tells me a lot about the person. Right. I agree with right. that. You can see on a face. But yeah. if people get too picky and then reject it quickly, straight away, um, you know, again, unless you're repulsed, if you're repulsed as a negative, that's very there, right. then okay. But otherwise, if it's par and everything else is aligned, go out. And unfortunately, people will will dismiss it and, and say no based if it's yeah. parf. I'm very curious because you're one type of person, but you deal with thousands of types of yeah. people. How do you always, how do you know how to coach them, whether to tell them yes or no, to go out, continue going out, getting engaged? Is that is judgment or there is common denominator? So if it's a shkafa, then it's important to go by your rav and your community and what's right for you. I don't, yeah. I don't do that. But when it's the real, the real problems people get into are more the deeper panemius. Wow. And so when the deeper, when the deeper foundations are there, when someone's healthy, when someone's balanced, when, when I see that they're looking at it the right way, when it's building in the right way, in a healthy way, right? Like yeah. that I can see no matter where you come from and what you are. And, right. you know, it's panemius. And how does one know that this is the one? If it feels like home. Wow. If they meaning, can see a meaning, future. You can only, but here's the caveat. You can only have it feel like home if you're at home in yourself. Wow. So if you're not at home in yourself, then that's the work you need to do first. Right. Right. 
But the one is someone that you have good communication with, good chemistry, that you is a mensch right. and has a similar value system to you. Right. And right? What's, what's, what's something that you feel a certain way that people should respect singles or how they should act to them differently than they are currently? Don't pity them. Mm -hmm. And don't treat them that you no, don't don't pity them and don't act as if you know why they're single. Wow. And be sensitive. Include them. Include them in meals and other things so they don't feel alone. Be sensitive to the aloneness. Wow. Would would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I kind of made as the saying Yiddish. Yeah, I made Shabbos for myself. The, the saying. I feel like yeah. I'm not dependent on other people and I don't want to be and I'm not involved. And I don't know, maybe that will change once I get married and I have a wife. So now I have to yeah. go to more places or go away for more Shabbosim. But as of now, I don't go away for Shabbos and I don't spend a lot of time outside. I just do my thing. It's, uh, and maybe possibly because of that, because of the judgment on the right. outside. Right, right. So, yeah, you also had a very successful event last night, uh, yesterday. Yeah. And it was... Um, for, for girls, and the name was there was no there's no shadichim crisis. What was the event about? Was it about chizik or was it about teaching girls how to date or how to get out there? What was the? There was a lot of this stuff that we're talking about today, and that the fact that you have, we have a lot more power over our reality than we realize. Hashem mm -hmm. gives us that power. Yeah. And when we focus on our vessel of getting out of our own way with the fears and the blocks and the worries and all those things, we can create a bigger Kaylee for Hashem to bring us what we want and deeply. And when we build that relationship with Hashem, so it was focusing on those two elements, myself and myself, Ben Adam La'atzmo and myself and Hashem, right. and relying on Hashem. And when we rely on Hashem, we create literally a conduit for Him to come down and right. to give us more abundance and right. Shefa. Because so, we can't do this on our own. It's impossible. No. It's impossible to have a marriage or a life or kids when you're just dependent on yourself. No, but it's limiting. It's so limiting. Right. We're built so much for more than that, right? Yeah. I'm, I was telling Hashem yesterday, you know, I do believe in magic because you create magic, right? What we call magic and the impossible, He does that. Hashem yeah. is, is capable of, of, of all of that. But He wants you involved. Wow. So we, so we, he wants you a partner in that. Right. So we can't sit back and wait for the magic, right? So how do we contribute to the magic? By doing our maximum ishtadlis. The, the, doing the ishtadlis on a spiritual level, tefillah and batachon, prayer and trust. By doing the practical ishtadlis, whatever that is for you, the apps, the events, the shatchans, the whatever it is, going to shul, yeah. making sure, and the inner work. Making yeah. sure, which is again the least done. The least done is the inner work to make sure that you're truly open and feel worthy to receive an amazing spouse and that you trust your decision making. The two biggest blocks I find in singles are self-worth and self-trust. They don't feel wow. worthy of a great person and they don't trust themselves to make the right decision. Yeah. Those are the two things they have to work on. Wow. That is, that is super powerful. Yeah. And how did you get into this, by the way? I'm just curious to wrap this up. This is like... Hashem. You... I made a deal with Hashem when I was single that I would help singles and uh, turned wow. into this. But uh, really, it was a combination of Hashem planning my life like a tapestry, right? And all the Maybe different I should things. make that same deal and I'll get engaged. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not why I got engaged, but that's a different story for a different time. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Right. But, it's, I don't know, Hashem, this was part of the, my tough kid, you know, to help and to get, I really get it from the inside. So hopefully I can give back. Right. Is there anything else you want to share to all the uh, viewers, listeners, maybe a word of chizik for both singles and people that are married and are struggling? Because we know a lot of people are married and not so happy. Yeah, that, that you're a work in progress and you're here to wrestle with those patterns and those issues so that you can become your greatest self. And whatever it is, it's going to change. It's not, whatever we're in, we're in the middle of a story. It's literally Megillus Esther. We live in the middle of Megillus Esther in our yeah. lives and it's always unfolding and don't give up, basically. Don't give up, take care of yourself, do the work, right? Yeah. Value yourself and that's often the work that has to start there and then uh and then it will continue it, it's, it's Hashem. like right. rely on Hashem. and what's your primary source now of helping people is it dating co uh, you're a dating coach right i have a course you, okay a course oh, i have, a, course I have a nine week course for women single women 
um, to teach them this exact technique that we talked that we about did. today, which was how to tune into your unconscious, subconscious blocks mm -hmm. and shift those so that you can be more open. In general, I mean, I do this with married people also. I do have a course that um, I can do with extra one-to-ones after that, like privately, not in the group course. Yeah. Um, but I really am passionate about teaching people how to tune right. into themselves. Wow. You also help married people? Or that's something Sometimes, like, but I just, oh, yeah? uh, on the side. When, when, right. when it You're comes also up. probably a shakha, no? No, I do not have time, unfortunately. No? No. Oh, okay, but just I guess you should. I, just I dabble ideas. in it, right? But I, I'm not. Wow. I can't. It's just, it's a really a full time job on its own. Wow. You know, but I work with with great shatkhans. Adopt a shatkhan is a great a great uh, organization. Okay, thank you so much like for your time. Me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you shared amazing stuff, amazing value. People are gonna love this. I'm sure they're gonna listen to it again and again because there is so much value over here. I uh, also want to thank all the listeners. Thank you so much. Please leave us a comment and ask any questions. If you have questions, I will try to forward it to Mrs. Jackie and then send the responses over here. So please leave a comment. Um, tell me how you enjoyed this episode. Please like the episode or rate the podcast wherever you're listening. And please share the podcast. Um, thank you very much. Also, thank you for my good friend Cheski Levy. He has a sound company. I will put his link in the description. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do -do 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 -do. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do